Good morning once again. The Lord be with you. Thank you so much. This morning our gospel text is from the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 5. And we will read and hear together verses 1 through 12. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. And if you'd like to follow along, you can find this text on New Testament page 4 in your pew Bible. And here's what it says. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So last Friday was, of course, Halloween. Fewer people might be able to answer what yesterday was. Anybody? All Saints. The feast or the festival of All Saints. November 1st is always designated as All Saints Day. A solemnity celebrated in parts of Western Christianity in honor of all the saints. While the Feast of All Saints on its current date goes back to the 700s in Pope Gregory III, some would contend that observance of the day can actually be traced to some 1400 years ago when Pope Boniface IV consecrated the Pantheon at Rome to the Virgin Mary and all the martyrs. In Protestant churches, the date of celebration is actually a bit more flexible, and it often falls on the first Sunday in November, which is why we call today All Saints Sunday. But regardless of its precise beginning or the date on which it's celebrated, I think the general intent of the day is fitting and proper because I believe that we ought to acknowledge with respect and with thanksgiving those saints who have helped to shape the church, who have helped to shape our faith, who have helped to shape even our lives. But this begs the question, who are the saints? I kind of put it to the children a couple of moments ago, but I wonder what we might say. How is a saint defined? Obviously, some traditions have very narrow criteria, saying that saints are those who have met certain requirements during the course of their lives. Others have very broad criteria, saying, in essence, everyone's a saint. I suppose that my thinking on the topic falls somewhere in the middle, and I would shy away from absolutizing either one of those perspectives. That being said, I truly appreciate the definition offered by Kenneth Woodward. And he says this, A saint is always someone through whom we catch a glimpse of what God is like. That's good, isn't it? A saint is always someone through whom we catch a glimpse of what God is like. 
In other words, saints are those who, in their lives, through their lives, reflect God's nature. And what is God's nature? Well, God is good and, and, and merciful, and so saints reflect goodness and mercy. God forgives and is generous. And so saints reflect forgiveness and generosity. To be sure, saints are those who in all things reflect love because if Scripture be believed, God is love. And I believe that to be a fitting characterization of a saint because the word itself derives from the Latin sanctus, which means holy. And what does it mean to be holy? Contrary to what some might say, it does not mean flawlessness. It does not mean spotlessness. It, it doesn't mean being free from error or temptation or mistake. It means rather that one's most earnest desire, one's most earnest aim is, as we heard last week, to love God entirely and to love one's neighbor as one loves oneself. Not only was this Reverend Wesley's understanding of the term, but it's also how Christ summarized the law and the prophets. And in the story from St. Matthew's Gospel this morning, we read of Jesus ascending a hill and then sitting down to teach his followers. It's a discourse that we have come to know as the Sermon on the Mount. And the snippet that we heard we call the Beatitudes, a compilation of condition and result proverbs the name of which comes from a Latin term meaning happiness. Among these, Jesus says, blessed or happy are those who are meek, those who desire righteousness, those who are pure in heart and those who make peace. Jesus, in sum, is describing the traits of a godly life. But he follows these descriptions with a distinct call to action, doesn't he? And he uses the, the well-known metaphors of his disciples being salt and light. If we would have read on just a few more verses, we would have heard this today. He, he calls his disciples salt and, and he calls his disciples light. Those who would help others to taste and see, as the psalmist says, that the Lord is good. Those who would illuminate the way for those to find refuge in God. But where it really hits home for me is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Because after Jesus talks about those who follow Him being gentle and, and pursuing justice and, and striving for peace, He says that it is through such things that our light will be seen and that through these good works, God will be glorified. We aren't glorified by our good works. We aren't glorified by the things that we do, by the things that we say, or at least that shouldn't be our aim, that should not be what we seek, but rather it is God who is glorified by the things that we say, more importantly by the things that we do, and that should always be our aim. Through our willingness, Jesus says, to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to give to those who ask, and to love not only friend, but even enemy. Through these things, we show whose children we are. And we offer a glimpse of what God is like. Truly, through Jesus, we see what God is like. But the thing of it is, what Jesus does, He does not do alone, does He? Throughout the Gospels, we read and we hear time and again, Jesus inviting others to participate in His work. To get up and to come along and then to go. He invites them to be participants in what He does. He brings others 
into offering God's redemption and restoration and reconciliation. He brings others into the sharing of God's salvific love. And I think that's where we come back to this notion, this idea of saintliness. Because saints aren't those who understand God perfectly. They aren't those who believe unquestioningly. They aren't even those who follow unhaltingly. They are simply those, they are simply those who hear the good news and being so convinced Respond as faithfully and as obediently as they are able. Participating with and alongside of Christ in ushering in the reign of God's righteousness. The final vision that God has for the whole of creation is one wherein hunger and thirst will be no more. One wherein the Lamb guides the multitude that no one can count to the springs of the water of life. In that place where we will see God as God is, our Maker will wipe away every tear from every eye and we will rejoice in God's salvation. But what do these images portray if not God's great love for all that God has made? But lest we think that that's only some vague promise of a faraway destination in the hazy distance, we ought to remember that our Savior spoke often, didn't He, of the kingdom not only as forthcoming but also present. Through Christ, the kingdom breaks into the here and now such that God's will is accomplished as we regularly pray on earth as it is in heaven. And this is why it's so vital for us to understand the necessity of being those participants to whom I referred just a few moments ago. Now we can sit back and watch the world burn and never bat an eye. We can pass the buck of responsibility saying that it's someone else's. We can, with all determination, turn aside from the lost and from the wandering, from the hurting and from the hopeless and leave them to their circumstance. Or we can be those who, in the name of Christ, wipe tears away. We can be those who set a feast and invite all to eat their fill. We can be those who speak life where death seems to have won. We can be those who place our lamps on lampstands, giving light so that all can see. This, I posit, is what it really means to be a saint. Saints aren't those, as I have been saying, who are perfect. At least not perfect in our normative understanding of the word. But they do strive to know Christ, but also to make Christ known through words and through deeds which depict the grace of God and point others to the same. So I suppose this is the question for the day. As I ask the children, who are the saints? Who are the saints in your life? Who do you know? Or who have you known that has glimpsed for you the character of God? Who do you know? Or who have you known that has shown love of God and love for their fellows? I've been blessed to know many who in various moments have helped me to see God as present and working in my life and in this world. Sometimes they have done so in very overt, very noticeable ways, and and sometimes I've only come to the realization after the fact. Martha Jones was a saint. Not a family member, by the way, but she was a fellow church member. And never have I known a more encouraging individual. She always spoke the truth. 
But it was never abrasive. It was never demeaning. Do you know anybody like that? They say, well, I'm just telling the truth. And they're just as nasty as they can be. (laughs) Martha spoke the truth, but it was always the truth in love. I can recall a number of occasions wherein I felt just absolutely down and out at the end of my rope about goings-on in my life, and she would typically be the very first one to find me on Sunday morning. In my church home, I sat over on that side of the nave, the very end of the pew, about four pews back, and she would find me on Sunday morning because she knew that I was going through something, struggling with something, and she'd place a hand on my shoulder and tell me everything was going to be okay. When I think of Jesus instructing his disciples toward meekness, toward purity, toward being those who offer peace, I think of Martha. I still have a plaque that she gave me on which is inscribed a poem that reminds the one who reads it, don't quit. I've always treasured it. And I've always taken its words, which truly were her words, to heart. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Martha. Bill Burnett is a saint, a longtime friend. Rarely have I met someone so devoted to God as this man. But listen, that doesn't mean that Bill doesn't struggle, that isn't to say that he doesn't have vices. Surely he and I have spent many hours talking about the various things that he struggles with. The addictions that he's fought against. The uncertainties about God that he has battled. But Bill, believing that God's grace is sufficient, continues to stand against those things. And the thing is, the beauty of his trials is that they help him to relate to others who might be going through the very same sorts of things. And when he's able to sit down and speak with these folks, saying, I know what you're feeling. I know what you're thinking. I've been there. Maybe I'm still there. When he's able to sit down and lend a willing ear to those folks, he embodies the presence of Christ. And in that way, he is able to help unbind them. He is able to help them go free. The children of our congregation are saints. And you don't have to look very hard to see this. They're always ready to share what they have. I wish more of them were here today to hear this. They're always willing to share what they have, whether it be a hug or a piece of candy or some talent with which God has graced them. And we have a lot of talented kids. But it's obvious what's in their hearts, isn't it? And one of the clearest examples came for me just a few weeks ago when after worship I returned to my office to find handfuls of sweets and greeting cards featuring words of appreciation which they had made for me by themselves. As I say, not all of our kids are here today, but to those who are, I want you to know how much that gesture meant to me. It blessed me beyond words. And it's a gift that I will always treasure because I saw God. I saw God through you. I saw God through your actions. Never underestimate how far a simple act of kindness and generosity can go. Were I able to speak all day, I would tell dozens more stories of saints that I have known. But here's what I want you to think about today. Who are they for you? Who are they in your life? Who are they? Who have they been for you? Dear ones, we... We can and we should take lessons from such people. We can and we should take lessons from others whom we would name and celebrate as saints this day. We can take lessons from those who have prayed for us. 
those who have provided for us, those who have sat with us, those who have given time to us, those who have counseled us, showing us the love of God in Christ and for us, bringing the kingdom near. We can learn from them and we can give thanks for them as we seek to ourselves be those through whom the divine light shines. May Almighty God, who has knit us together in one communion and fellowship in the body of Christ, give us grace to follow those blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those indescribable joys our Maker has prepared for those who love God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.